Hello my dragon seeds, welcome to Fantasy Haven. This is the spoiler review for episode 7 of House of the Dragon, Driftmark of the Dragon. Best episode yet? Well, maybe. Spiders and stares, glances and glares, kids being mean, adults beating up this teen. Seriously, give Aegon a break. Episodes 6 and 7 feel like a two-parter, and this slower episode gives us some time to just breathe and soak everything in. I love episodes where all the main characters are just gathered in one place. It's satisfying to watch a scene with little dialogue while perfectly understanding everyone's relationship with each other. I want to shout out a couple of the minor characters that people are overlooking. Corliss's brother does not fuck around. So far we've seen Vaemond roasting Daemon, and now not so subtly roasting Rhaenyra and her children. He must have been thrilled with this ending scene. His obsession with Valarian blood is good foreshadowing for his later actions, which I suspect we'll see in the next episode. And Helena is already an improvement from her book counterpart, who doesn't really do anything. I like that they've made her a dragon dreamer and she's muttering prophecies all the time. Maybe if Viserys gave a shit about his children with Alicent, he'd actually realise this. In the previous episode, she muttered that Aemon must close an eye, which comes to fruition here. I love the poetic flow of her prophetic statements. This episode, she said, Hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh weaving dragons of thread. Alright, time to have a, <laughs> an alt shift X moment, I guess. The spools of green and black refer to the two factions that have formed, Alicent's greens and Rhaenyra's blacks. Dragons of flesh, meaning Targaryens, are weaving dragons of thread, banners or flags perhaps. Or maybe it's a reference to Rhaenyra having bastard children, weaving dragons of thread trying to pass her children off as legitimate. It's all a dark look into the future of this familial conflict. Hand turns loom might be a general statement about both sides being involved, or it could be a reference to the Hand, Otto Hightower, whose actions have certainly helped stoke these tensions. Rhaenyra and Daemon finally hook up, and while they don't have the same fiery, passionate chemistry, it makes sense. Their sex scene is slow, tender, awkward. It's two wounded souls coming together again. I don't find it romantic, I find it weird and complex and kind of sad. Although, I do have to admit, it's not as well filmed as the sex scenes in episode 4, directed by Claire Kilner. And I'm still waiting to see what kind of chemistry Matt Smith and Emma Darcy have, because I didn't detect too much this episode, unfortunately. Corliss and Rhaenys have their best scene yet. Their worldviews clash. Corliss clearly cares about the pursuit of legacy, but doesn't care about Rhaenyra's children actually being bastards, as long as history remembers them as being legitimate Valarion princes. Meanwhile, Rhaenys considers Corliss's obsession with legacy and her claim to the throne as emblematic of his personal pride and ambition. And she clearly does not accept the strong bastards. It's quite interesting to see this tension in, in a relationship that we know is genuinely loving. So the episode went from good to great and then it became amazing. Every scene after Aemond claims Vhagar is a banger. The dragons are cool and all, but I've never really cared too much about them. In Game of Thrones, Fire and Blood, or this show, they interested me the most in Hot D. I appreciate their distinctive designs and, you know, Caraxes is cool and all that, but this scene finally made me enthusiastic about the D words. It was paced beautifully. Aemond creeping up and taming this huge beast, clambering up onto her back and launching into the sky. I thought they were going to cut away, but they didn't. We see Vhagar racing through the sky while Aemond holds on for dear life. I genuinely got chills watching this scene. But then we go to another amazing scene. I was wondering how they were going to translate the fight scene from Fire and Blood without making it feel awkward or goofy, but no, it felt real. It was really well edited and directed and the child actors were all believable. Game of Thrones knew how to get awesome child actors and Hot D is no different. Then we move on to this scene. Oh, I can't decide, is the Vhagar scene the best scene or is this the best scene? The build up and the tension and the dialogue was fantastic. Mostly fantastic. I could have done without Alison saying this is insufficient or Viserys using the word calumnies. Calumnies. It was kind of a weird writing choice, although credit to the actors, they made it work. Somehow Olivia Cook as Alison said that is insufficient in a way that was so emotional. It was only after the episode I thought that was kind of a weird line. And same with, with Paddy saying calumnies. Calumnies. Like on paper, that's, that's a bit of a stupid line. Like just say lies, don't say calumnies. But Paddy made it work. I don't know how they do it. The acting is awesome all round, uh, but I praise Emma Darcy for the childbirth scene last week. So I'll move the spotlight onto Olivia Cook for this week. She 
nailed it. She nailed the fear, the disbelief, the anger of a mother whose son just got wounded with a knife, and the pent-up fury of a woman who's performed her duty regardless of her personal desires, <laughs> while her former friend gets away with flouting all rules and traditions. It was a defining moment, and I think we can say that this is the moment when the Blacks and the Greens were truly formed, and when Walter White finally became Heisenberg. Calumnies. But it's still not over, we get another fantastic montage scene at the end. In Fire and Blood, Carl Corey kills Lanor, either in a crime of passion or because he was hired by Damon. So you decided to trick the book fans, huh? You know what? I respect it. At first I was filled with dread watching this scene. Damon is ruthless enough to order such a murder, and canonically he probably is responsible in Fire and Blood, but Rhaenyra? It felt like too big a jump for her character, especially after her tender moment with Lenor earlier. Don't get me wrong, Rhaenyra still plots the murder of this innocent guy, and thrusts suffering upon Corlys and Rhaenys, showing her growing ruthlessness, but she went out of her way to spare her husband, and give him the freedom to escape from politics and responsibility. This show has made a couple of questionable changes from the book, but in my opinion this one is an improvement for sure. It does open up some questions though. In the book his dragon sea smoke is claimed by someone else, but if Lanor's alive will he have to return and replace this character? Or are dragons incapable of maintaining a long distance relationship? But anyway, this is a 9 out of 10 episode for me. But does anything bring it down? The time skip stuff is still affecting the pacing. We don't get to see Rhaenyra mourning Harwin in private or Lanor making his huge decision. And Damon's oddly homoerotic conversation with Carl was kind of ridiculously cryptic. I guess we can assume their conversation continued after that scene. <laughs> Damon gives him money and is like, A quick death. One with witnesses. And slinks away and Carl's like, Yeah, cool, but what, what, what do you want me to do, bro? As for the darkness that everyone's complaining about, Maybe it's my TV or my TV settings or something, but I didn't have a problem with it. I do agree that the day to night didn't look realistic. I don't know if that was a problem with the weather on the day in production or, or the kind of filter they used, I don't know. But I had no trouble seeing what was happening, so I can't personally judge the episode for that, even though I fully understand that many people, well, most people did have trouble and were very annoyed by it. So, three episodes left of this generational conflict, I cannot wait. Like and subscribe to see my review next week, and feel free to check out my other videos, including the early ones, which suck. See ya! Calumny.